Um, I want to start with, uh, uh, have you guys seen this uh, AI that is able to play games, right? No, this Atari games uh, from DeepMind. And there was a, a funny comment on Twitter that was like, uh, wait, wasn't supposed AI to uh, do stuff for us while we were playing games, while they are playing games <laughs> and we are doing stuff. So still AI is not where we want to, to be. Um, how many of you uh, know about TensorFlow? By raise of hands, how many of you use TensorFlow? Okay. So we will talk about uh, the work that I have been doing in uh, H2O, and it was uh, about integrating TensorFlow with uh, all our uh, platform. Okay. Um, so as you might have heard during the day, uh, the code name for this integration is called DeepWater. And the objective is to have uh, TensorFlow, CAFE, and MXNet uh, completely integrated uh, under an abstraction layer. And so the MXNet is the one that has uh, further development at this stage and is what uh, uh, the next presentation will uh, actually show uh, code execution. Um, the second one is the TensorFlow, which was started in, in July. And we go uh, deeper in, okay, what is required? How does this integration work at the technical level? And so this is, uh, it's all open source. You guys can go and Contribute, contrib uh, contribution are welcome. And uh, we will go inside the, the TensorFlow backend. Um, as you see, there is a MaxNet backend uh, and soon also the CAFE backend. So let's start with uh, the components. So the first component uh, is uh, the library itself. Out of TensorFlow, we take the C++ library. You guys know that there is uh, the C++ library and then there is the Python bindings and then the Python library on the official TensorFlow uh, distribution. And of all of that, uh, uh, we extract the TensorFlow library uh, written in C++. And to access that from uh, HO, HO is written in Java, we need to have a, a layer that will create a GNI library that is able to call from Java the C++ operations. And finally, we have our deep water uh, interface layer that is able to uh, have that common API calls from Java on top of all the existing libraries. Okay, so we have uh, uh, TensorFlow, uh, J Java CPP, and then on top of that, the deep water Java uh, interface. And on top of that, our uh, HO system. So HO will call the deep water uh, uh, interface and uh, from HO, you can use all the good stuff that you already used to uh, utilize from, uh, from this library. So all the data manipulation, all the data mangling is gonna be already there for you to use and you can then select which backend you want to utilize. Uh, we will provide some of the most common deep learning uh, uh, algorithms already available without you to have to, to code and uh, implement. And uh, this should uh, improve a lot your uh, uh, iterations and exploration of what can be done with uh, deep learning for your specific uh, uh, problem. So how do you train a TensorFlow model in deep water? Okay, let's, let's go even deeper. Of course, you need first to declare a model. And to declare a model, there are three key steps that needs to be uh, defined. One is the inference step, and this is, once the model is created, is the step that's gonna be run over and over doing the prediction in an in a online fashion. But to train, you need to define what's your loss function that you want to optimize, okay? And then, of course, you want to specify which optimizer to use. Now, this is a bit different uh, respect uh, existing uh, uh, machine learning algorithms because before all of this was already pre-selected for you while in deep learning you have this uh, uh, possibility to to create new algorithms to compose different blocks 
and, uh, and create new models. But uh, let's, let's look at the, at the sample code. This is some, some Python code that uh, uh, I wrote, and uh, it's a simple Linnet uh, model. So we have uh, uh, a batch image input, like a set of images, then we apply a convolution uh, 2D, uh, a filter of five by five pixel uh, with 20 different uh, uh, it's called filters, and the main is the kernel. So you have this five by five and um, 20 filters in, in depth. Uh, originally was used the hyperbolic tangent activation function. So if it's uh, beyond that threshold, it will activate, otherwise the neuron will not activate. Then uh, you have a max pooling 2D, same uh, tricks. It will take the maximum over a two by two uh, layer. Then you have a, um, another convolution, tangent, max pooling. Then you flatten everything out, and then you have the fully connected uh, block. Okay? Uh, and so you see how these, these elements of the neural network are composable. You, nothing will uh, prevent us to add even more of each of these single uh, layers. Okay? And, uh, and, and the final is uh, you want to have a categorical categorical prediction out of, uh, of this uh, output. Um, and then, uh, this is just the inference. Now, giving, giving a, a set of images, I want to know what's the classification of those images. And we do it in batch because it's more efficient for, uh, for the hardware. Um, then we have to uh, specify, only for the training part, what's the loss. And what we are doing here is uh, uh, the categorical cross-entropy between uh, what are the real label and what are the predicted labels. And we want to minimize that between what, this is a, um, a supervised training, okay, so we know what are the actual labels for each of the image, and we want to minimize the two. Uh, well, we put uh, uh, categorical accuracy just to, to know how good is our uh, model doing during training, and uh, finally we use uh, a simple gradient descent optimizer. Okay, this is a very uh, easy way of, of visualizing uh, what's the structure of the network, uh, what's going to uh, be implied inside uh, the training process. But uh, what really happens inside TensorFlow? So let's, let's go deeper and see, okay, what are, are, are we actually doing inside? Um, as you know, we are building a graph, a computational graph. When you're using the Python library, you are not executing anything. You're just specifying what is your computation. Okay, so it's just uh, symbolic links, if you want to say. It's just a, a graph. And this graph is composed by uh, a set of operations. And one way of specifying the graph is just by saying, uh, uh, by specifying its links. Okay, I can say operation one is connected to operation two, operation one is connected to operation three, just as a list of nodes. And let's remember this point. In TensorFlow terms, the links are called the tensors because that's the data transfer that you have from one operation to the other operation, okay? And if you ever wonder why the name TensorFlow is because you can see how the tensors are flowing through the graph from operation to operation. One operation transforms a set of uh, tensor inputs and outputs a set of uh, tensors that can be either consumed by other operation or can be the, your final stage. And so the question is, okay, uh, how do I execute this graph? Now, how do you execute operation and inspect this tensor? It's, if you have uh, uh, the code, uh, it's pretty easy. Like, you just execute the code. But this is not the, the case, because you have a graph. And so the, the trick is each operation and each tensor has a name. Either you give the name, or TensorFlow framework will assign one. And the entry point at the C library level is this function, that is a simple run function. We are at the C library level here, 
and we are saying to the TensorFlow framework, this is my graph, and this is what I want you to execute out of that graph. And so you have a list of inputs that you want to give. In our example, it was the batch of images. And then you have a, um, a set of outputs that you want to retrieve after the graph has been computed. And then you want to have a set of operations that you want to run. This can be utility operations that you want to execute along your, uh, your, uh, your graph. And so as I was saying, this is easy to use if you have the code. You, know, you have your Python script, uh, you execute the session that run, and you can always say, okay, this is my graph and this is my variable, variable.name, execute. But that's not always the case, okay? Because when you go in production, you need some form of saving the state uh, and restoring it. And the code that does that if it's in production, might be uh, using multiple models at the same time. It does not assume that you have the original Python script that created the graph definition, okay? And so let's, let's see how you actually do, how do you save a state in, in, in TensorFlow? What's actually being produced? What's the asset? And so the asset in TensorFlow is a, a protocol buffer object. And for you that are not familiar with the, the format, uh, is, uh, there is a file that's the definition of what's the content of it, and is um, highly serialized to disk. And so in this example, this is uh, the definition, the protocol buffer definition of a graph, and, and as you see, it's repeated node def, so that means there are one or more uh, node definition. And then you have the node definition that has name and other uh, attributes that I did not include in this slide. And so you see a graph on the disk is just a list of nodes. And the nodes have names. But which of those nodes are the one that we actually want to use? Each graph could have different names for the same logical operation. Okay, no, it's not guaranteed. Just think from the HO perspective. No, it's not guaranteed when I get a graph that they see the same names, okay? So I need a way of saying, of specifying, okay, this is the loss function, this is the inference function, this is the name of my input tensor, this is my name of the output tensor, this is the name of the saving operations, and so on. And so what you need is a metagraph. A metagraph is a bit more complicated protocol buffer definition that gives some insight on this graph. It's like, okay, these are uh, known entry point, known operation names inside the graph. And out of many, many uh, attributes that you need to specify graph, even if the graph is pretty easy, having the uh, structure around it to be able to manipulate it uh, is not trivial. There are two main parts that are interesting to us. One is the graph definition, that is actually what we saw before, the list of all the nodes. And then we have the saver definition, that is the list of operations that you need to save and restore. Okay? And so let's look at the complete workflow of what you will need to do from, from the beginning to the end. So you're going to have to add the inference part. You, go, you add the loss function. You do the optimization method. Then you serialize this metagraph. Okay? We're going to give some tools to be able to just say, okay, this is my model. The, first three steps, please serialize and make it uh, so that uh, uh, you can then do step number five, that you can load this metagraph from inside the water, and then we are able to execute the step six and seven in um, production-ready uh, mode. And so you will only uh, have that creative part of thinking about this model and uh, uh, create this new loss function, create new, this uh, optimization method. Okay, so you can break it down inside the uh, three different steps from Python, even R, anything that can create a TensorFlow graph definition with our uh, settings will be able to be loaded from uh, the deep water uh, uh, system because underneath is just the same TensorFlow engine we add all, uh, all the HO capabilities of man uh, managing all the data frames. Okay, um, 
can give a sneak peek of uh, what's available right now in, uh, in the open source part, and it's just the Java binding. And so this is, you can see this is our uh, uh, deep water interface that you, we are calling as uh, uh, backend train is uh, one of the interface that we implemented, and what you do, you have uh, um, an MNIST image data set, a very easy benchmark that we can do in, inside our integration test, and uh, we just build a, uh, a network on this data set. We have some runtime options, some backend parameters, uh, give it a number of classes, and in this case, the model name, the model name will be Linet, and so the backend now is all Linet, then Linet is this pre-built graph definition that uh, we store inside the distribution. And then at that point, uh, it's uh, all deep water where uh, we have the batch iterator store, the image batch, and that's the usual uh, training system. And this, you can do it from Java, so you have still to code all the Java part, but uh, uh, soon, uh, uh, in our roadmap, you will be able to do it uh, from Jupyter itself, code in Python, and then send it to a uh, natural backend. Okay, so in, in Q3, we uh, started building uh, the first uh, uh, integration part. Uh, we have all the build systems set up, uh, we have all the jar si systems, so all the integration part will be taken care of for, for you. You don't have to worry about uh, which version do I have to install, which things I have to compile, the libraries. All of that will be just a single jar that uh, will be integrated inside the HO. Um, and then during this uh, Q4 2016, we'll be adding other uh, uh, support, at least from the TensorFlow part. MXNet, as I said, is, uh, is further uh, advanced, and you will not have to do any changes besides uh, specifying what's your backend and eventually specifying your Python code. And so, as always, you have a lot of uh, code, docs, and uh, tutorials of uh, what's going on uh, inside the deep learning and deep water. Uh, the GitHub is HOO AI deep water. So please feel free to look around and, and test it out. Um, and that's it. If you want to know more about deep learning, I usually post and put updates on what's going on deep water. Some cool stuff that I see in the, in the, in the field. So, do we have time for uh, we some questions? We have time for one Q&A. If not, we want to go straight into the next uh, workshop. Okay. Any question? Yeah, question. Fabrizio, you're always going to be around. Yes. For